I'm Eros Simoncelli. I'm a theorist at NYU in the Center for Neuroscience. Well, I mean, I think the simple answer is that theory provides a sort of embodiment of our current hypotheses about how the brain works. And I think it gives you a sort of uh, a scaffolding on which you can place various experimental results and try to fit them together. Uh, and particularly, particularly important for fitting together results that are coming from uh, disparate forms of measurement at different levels. So you want to fit together um, some observations about ecological need with circuitry, with molecular uh, behaviors, behaviors of ion channels, and you would like all of that to sort of fit together in some sort of sensible package that can explain how the whole enterprise operates, the enterprise being the brain. Um, so I think, and I think that you can't connect those things without having some sort of a, 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 an overarching theory. I don't think we've done a particularly great job, us theorists, um, in making theories that are um, accessible. And I think that that's the thing that really, it, it is changing and it has to continue changing. A lot of the things that we do uh, come across as very abstract, kind of sort of obscure, described in language that's not understood by most of the field. And I think that that's um, slowly getting better, and I think we have to keep working at it. Flipping to tools, which I think of as kind of different, although with some connection. Um, the tools are important for connecting data to theory, and the two examples that I always think of, partly because they're things that I've worked on and that are important to me, are fitting models to data that's undergone really a revolution in the last 20 years. And methods for extracting information from um, raw measurements, so things like spike sorting or uh, processing calcium images come to mind. Um, those, so those things are obviously critical to the field. I think the experimentalists, um, on the whole, the, the, the field appreciates those contributions more in some sense because they, um, they have immediate impact and everybody needs them. I would say there are um, sort of princ grand principles or frameworks for thinking about um, the problem that I think have had a big impact on the field. And, you know, examples are things like um, efficient coding, you know, Barlow. Even if you think it's wrong, it affects the way you think about problems. It, it gives you a, a sort of context in which to think about data and the relationships between data that I think is really important. Other examples would be, um, you know, optimal decision or estimation theory. There's a long history of uh, using those kind of methodologies in engineering and they've obviously been really important. Uh, we use responses of neurons to perform tasks. And, um, you know, the psychophysicists were way ahead of the neuroscientists on this one. They realized, um, you know, 60, 80 years ago that making careful measurements uh, from the outside, they could sort of put that in a framework that had to do with ideal observers and signal detection theory, um, how it is that you, you compute things given noisy or unreliable measurements. And more recently, maybe things like balanced EI, uh, in networks, things like concepts like that that are that are very, uh, they're very intuitive uh, in in their basic form, and they obviously have to have some play some role in in the evolution of something like the brain. They they, they govern the, the brain has to operate under principles that um, allow it to to function in a, in a sort of sensible and stable way, and so those principles are sort of gu guidance I think for everybody in the field. And from principles, so that was one. And then t the second thing that I would say are models. And by models, I mean something a little more specific than a principle. I mean you know, a very particular description or, or format for, for capturing behavior of neurons or populations. And there you think of things like hop field nets. I think those had a big impact. The idea that you could um, wire up some sort of uh, recurrent circuit, that you could teach it things, that it could remember them, that it could be uh, jostled to remember them by giving it partial inputs. Those ideas are all still with us. They show up in a lot of papers. They're, they're kind of there. They show up a little bit in the discussion section. Maybe they're not using those models in very precise ways, but the concepts are, are I think, important to the field, and they have had a big impact. Um, Linear, nonlinear models, artificial neural networks have had a big impact on the field, and they will continue to now, with all of the, the all of the um, amazing but also overhyped results from uh, deep neural networks. Uh, I think that uh, there there's there are interesting things there that we can learn from and that we can contribute to both directions. 
Um, things like local gain control, that's been really, those ideas are around since the 60s or the earlier. Um, they got a big bump uh, in the 90s when David Heger made it, put together his theory of normalization. And, you know, those are recurrent themes. They show up all over the place in the brain, and we see them showing up in, in models and in discussions and in ideas. So I think those, these things have had a big impact. I want to say that the founders of Cosine did something really amazing for all of us, and we should be grateful. They created a, a really high-quality meeting that's focused on exactly that, on bringing together experimentalists and theorists. I think it's been tremendously successful, and they've managed to kind of maintain that success and grow it over um, quite a few years. I think we can't take this for granted. It's really easy for something like Cosine, which is, has been so beautifully balanced for a lot of years, to go off the rails, to become dominated by a particular sub-community, to become um, imbalanced even just between theory and experiment. I think that was part of the idea that Zach and Tony and Alex had in the beginning, that it needed to be balanced in that way. And I think that needs to be enforced. The other thing I would say is that um, it's critical that we keep working to teach people especially the younger generation, um, how to communicate across these boundaries. And Cosine plays an important role in that regard. But I think, you know, we're still failing in a lot of cases. I won't name names, but, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of talks on both sides, frankly, um, where they're, they're just not that accessible. They're not that easily understandable by folks on the other side of the fence. And um, one of the things that I, has been really important for me is um, we, need to, we need to train uh, people. We need to train exper experimentalists to understand basic mathematics, the fundamentals that underlie all models. You don't have to teach them the latest and greatest fancy complicated calculation, but you better give them a good grounding so that when they hear about these things they can kind of figure it out or at least get a sense of what's going on. That means teaching them to think about multidimensional data. It means they actually should all know linear algebra. Um, it means teaching them to think about, you know, some basic basic things about Fourier transforms and, st and statistics in multiple dimensions. You know, there, there's a list of things that, you know, I won't go through, but those are those I've put this into action for myself by building them into the course that I teach at NYU. The course was very successful for students that coming back into the lab and, and having all these new capabilities to do analysis of their data, and it became a required course of the department. I don't know that that's true in most neuroscience departments. And, you know, I'm not saying this out of, you know, because of my course. I'm saying that something like that should be done universally. That should be true everywhere. And I'll flip it around. I think the theorists should be forced to take basic courses in you know, cellular and molecular uh, neuroscience and, in, uh, and also in sort of systems and um, you know, behavioral neuroscience. And I think um, without understanding some, a little bit about experiments and what goes into making experiments, and probably even more important than that, the scientific reasoning that's built up around experiments. It's, it's usually the sort of mathematicians or the computer scientists that are most guilty of this. They, they often don't have a very good sense about how to think about scientific reasoning, scientific logic. Um, what is it, what are you doing when you're building an experiment? What are you looking for? How do you, when you interpret the results? You know, it's not like doing a proof. It's, it's different and it's a style of thinking that you have to sort of get used to. So I think Teaching people to think more flexibly and to think across these boundaries is absolutely critical. Of course it's happening. It's happening. It's been happening over the last 20 or 30 years. But um, I think we still have a long way to go.